Welcome Classic Rock fans to the second part of my Steve Hackett interview. But we move away from discussing uh, the excellent new solo album Surrender of Silence to looking at more Genesis themed topics shall we say. Anyway, let's get straight into it shall we? I mean, um, uh, another guitar player who I, I greatly admire and band I love is Steve Rothery cited mm. you as an influence. I'm just wondering, do you ever hear um, your playing or, or your influences in, in newer guitar players, um, you know, and how is your, how do you think your guitar style has perhaps evolved over the years? Um, Quite heavy question. I am aware of other, other guitarists and, and Steve Rothery and I, um, we're, 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 we're pals. In fact, we, we, we went off to, to um, Whitby recently. To go. Oh, okay. um, he grew up, funnily enough. So, um, it, very interesting, you know, an area that he knows very well. No. Uh, Dracula, it's very Dracula. And his wife is called Joe as well. Sorry, it's very Dracula themed, isn't it? With me. Well, that's it. There's that. There's it. You know, the most famous resident, of course, a bit like Baker Street, never actually existed. So, yeah, you've yeah. Got that. You've got to look, Holmes Baker Street, Dracula, Whitby, um, and um, it's um, yeah. Um, other guitarists. Uh, it's always a joy when someone who plays really well, as 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 Steve Rothery does, uh, says they like what you do or mm -hmm. you've been an influence, and um, uh, it surprises me that people who are so accomplished say, "Oh, I took that from you," or "I did that," because um, I, I I always think I'm just starting out, but evidently I'm not. Evidently. Um, there's been a lot of history and every now and again, I remind myself I've been professional now for 50 years. Yeah. 50 years ago, I joined Genesis. Yeah. Uh, but I'm going to bring playing you to uh, uh, another question I have for you. Yes, by all means. Well, actually, I mean, it's, um, it's the 50th anniversary this year of the great nursery crime album. Yes. And yes. I was curious to know uh, whether you know of anything or any plans to perhaps mark that occasion or sell it, whether there's anything in the vault they could dredge out and dust off and, and release, uh, if there's any plans to do anything uh, with that uh, right. Um Well, there are many, um, I think there are many live recordings. There are many, some of which are bootlegs, mm -hmm. um, um, I there doesn't seem to be any um, attempt audience, to audience recorded bootlegs or or uh, from the actual Sorry? board. Are they audience recordings or from the soundboard? Well, they 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 um they're a mixture of things. Okay. And I, but I'm not in the driving seat of of, of this. So I I can't drive that car for you. But I would yeah. say you know there are a lot of really good performances that I I would see you know the light of day at some point. But um. Uh, but those who are in power um, seem fit not to not to do that. Um, okay. um, however, I do think there's lots lots of really great bootlegs. To be honest, you know, and and, and board mixes they they vary in quality, of course. And mm -hmm. I wouldn't say oh go out and buy buy this. You know, um, what you you're not really exacting quality control. Or either you say well all of it. Is a, is a bit interest, even though, you know, a particular recording, you might just be hearing a band in the distance and a, and a tambourine <laughs> right in the front of the microphone, and then you'd yes. be going, oh, oh, I'm not sure about this, this suffering through this. Um, yes. um, all this stuff could be uh, bogus material rather than bonus material, as my wife yeah. says. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, um... I think uh, the Doors had their Bright Midnight series, and they released even audience recordings. Uh, I think they figured that right. fans wanted, so just, just put it out, I suppose. Uh, but um, um, yes, would well, well, that that was the the case? Because um, I think in the case of Zep, there's been this, um, mm. and um, I think the more you try and control it. Um, I think you aren't really showing the whole of the history. So, you know, there is, there's a lot of stuff, stuff that's, you know, sitting there in, in the vaults. Will it ever see the light of day? I don't know. Mm. Um, it's interesting, of course, you're, you're referencing the um, Seconds Out album on this new tour. It's a 30-day nationwide tour. Well, it stretches, yeah, throughout the UK. Uh, it's it's it, it'll be the most comprehensive tour that I've done for a very long time. 
Yes. yes. I mean, I managed to catch a um, few of your your dates on previous tours, but what? Uh, obviously, you're referencing the music, the um, second out album. Uh, yes. What else goes through your mind when you're thinking about putting together a set list? I mean, are there any? Is there anything that you would um, say? Well, oh, I definitely would not play that, <laughs> or for whatever reason. Um, well, you know what what's happened um, in recent years. I, whenever I did Genesis Revisited stuff, as well mm. as solo stuff, so I do set of solo and, and then the Revisited stuff. I'm cherry picking across all of the albums, thinking. I know this one works. This is a stage favorite. Let's let's do this, and then um, to coincide with um, you know dates and celebrating things, um, we did the whole of Spectral Mornings, pretty much the whole of it, um, yeah. and, and and the whole of Silly England by the Pound, uh, which so that was the last live album, and uh, that came out really really well. Um, and suppose I suppose I was thinking. Well, you're 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 doing albums now, really. So um, at this point, it's it's seconds out, which in itself was a compilation album of what we considered to be the best of what we'd done from previous things, yeah. um, and um, uh, that you know things that were specially selected for for that album, um, and so in the future, um, I've. I've got a choice. Yeah, yeah. Do I do I do a whole album or or um, uh, do I, you know, limit it? So yes, there will be those moments of if you listen to a whole album. Obviously, some tracks are going to be stronger than others. But then, on the other hand, yeah. with something like Selling England, you would have the little tracks like More Fool Me, um, After the Ordeal, uh, Isle of Plenty, those sorts of things. But they are curios within themselves, and I think they gain a certain credibility or gravitas, or just sound sweeter with the passing of time. Yeah. Uh, so things that seemed like doodles at the time, it's funny how they get set in concrete and yeah. go into the hearts and minds of not just listeners, but also um, myself, having been in, in, involved with all of that. So, yeah, you, you go completist. And you've got to jump in with both feet. Sure. And with the seconds out, out album, a lot of fans uh, have um, spoken to me about how they they had some live or bootleg recordings from round about that tour, and that yeah. they, and, and that your guitar was particularly not mixed very well on the original album. I just wonder what yeah. are your thoughts about that? Uh, well, I think um, if you see the the show that we're going to do. Um, uh, I think that, that the guitar will be heard. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I think that it was a bit guitar light, that album. Um, but, um, I mean, I'm not going to argue about old mixes. The, the, these things have been remixed with time. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I could understand politically why that would have happened. Um, but... Um, I wasn't attached at that point. I was leaving the band at that point. Sure. Um, I never had a pro problem with the band's material. Sure. Um, sure. I think the band's politics at one time was firmly anti-solo, and that was all to change. You know, after two people had left, you know, a a any band worth its salt is is in danger of once it starts to hemorrhage members. Um, yeah. You have to address the, the solo aspect. Um, people have to let off steam, yeah. and the public want to know what you can do on your own. Um, yeah, sure. Yeah, you know, well, I mean, it's, uh, love band. so there we go. Sure. I mean, I have to. Um, I've got one more question. Really, it's a question that's been thrown at me by a subscriber. Sure. Um, uh, what are your memories of recording "Watcher of the Skies"? Uh, are there any stories to, about the recording of that? particular song well uh i remember we bought the mellotron off of robert fripp okay king crimson had mellotrons to spare yeah. we needed one i was convinced that the genesis needed to have a mellotron well, they're, quite, um, they're quite tricky instruments to work with and a few people have said they're quite tricky they were tricky uh, in every 
since the word very tricky, it took four men to lift the Mark II. <laughs> um, and, um, and live, certainly, you get condensation on the t tapes and they would stick sometimes. So it wouldn't yeah. always perform to order. Yeah. Um, it's a very you know, delicate thing that was you know, designed originally, I think, you know, for, the, for the home organ market, really. But yeah. we fell in love with it. The Beatles first. And and the rest of us second. Um, so I I, I love that. And um, straight away, even when we were at King Crimson's uh, rehearsal place, mm -hmm. um, Tony started mixing the brass with the strings, and and I think probably using the English accordion for the bass. And you had the the sound of of Water of the Skies right then and there. Wow. And um. um and it sounded magnificent, particularly right. live, particularly when the song was still being written. We were rehearsing up the thing in bits. Yeah. When we were in Reggio Emilia, for instance, in Italy, and in those palace vaults where it filled the, um, you know, filled the, 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 uh, the place, um, you know, the foundations were, were shaking with that. And, and, and I loved the power of it. And it seemed like yeah. the, the orchestra in the box arrived along with an alien landing craft and right, um, right. so I, I found it a hugely imaginative I, I i loved it and um it's a great tune it's always really needed a visual to pull it off yeah in some way or another when when genesis did it it was peter gabriel with the bat wings and the the uv lights um to give it a certain presentation sometimes with dry ice all of that you know give it yeah. the theatricality when i revived it many many years later um um, we created a star field that would then travel out towards people. So you felt that you were traveling as you were hearing the, the yeah. crescendo of the song and um, loved doing that, we, we, you know, with, with um, LED screens and... Sure. Um, I mean, the and visuals, and the, yeah. and, the visuals and the lights are really, really good, but fantastic with your uh, solo performances. And the, you know, luckily, a lot of them have been filmed as well. Uh, how much say do you actually have in the stage design and lighting design of your, your shows? Uh, well, I try to get involved um, in as much as I can. Okay. Um, if I dream up an idea, I'll, I'll get it across to our, our lighting man. I mean, for instance, when we were doing some delicate passages last time um, we were live, um, I had the idea of doing a song called Virgin and the Gypsy, and I remember the last time we tried to do that, um, I don't think the technology was really there to support that sort of level of delicacy of, of song, but um, I thought for those little tinkly moments where you've got guitars and harpsichords and 12 strings all chiming away together, um, perhaps in a very Genesis-like manner, mm -hmm. um, I thought if you could have that equivalent being uh, reflected in, in the lights so you've got these little sort of little reflected things so we were using half mirror balls and and, and using that were revolving and, and um, hitting them with a lot of lot of light so you've got a tremendous amount of light around the auditorium and and on the stage so there's little tinkling moments and I noticed that audiences seem to be very quiet whereas at one time those tinkling moments might have been shouted down by by the crowd particularly in America in the old days, you know, when they just wanted a boogie. So if you gave them the equivalent of Disneyland with the lights, um, people would actually perhaps, you know, respond to it in a way where, where you've got the right sort of marriage of, of visuals and, um, and sound. And uh, other moments, like for instance, at the cinema show, we used it, we used it with that, as well, so that the more delicate moments were reflected with the delicate lighting. And um, I think that that worked enormously well. Yeah. I mean, you, it's interesting you mentioned the um, American audiences. Uh, so it seems that Floyd struggled a lot with their American audiences in the late 70s, uh, you know, not paying attention to the softer acoustic pieces. And we got that yeah. famous Montreal incident, of course, where Waters responds quite vitriolically against a, a overeager fan, shall we say? Um, yeah. 
Well, you, well one, one had all of that. I think that um, the thing about uh, what we now refer to as progressive rock is that part of the reason why it works is because you have those wide dynamics. You have the loud bits, you have the quiet bits, yeah. and the loud bits sound all the more loud when the ensemble comes in with something that's well rehearsed, well trained, like a crack regiment. Um, it's all the better. If you're at full volume from, from the word go, um, I think that there's a danger of tuning out. It's, it's like having um, a guitarist playing salvos, salvos all night where it's yeah. coming at you at 100 miles an hour. Um, I think you need to be able to digest it. You need to be able to breathe. Um, yeah. And you can still have those moments of people being pinned to the back wall if you want. Yeah. Um, but part of this genre that, that embraces all the other genres, this progressive thing, mm. means that you can draw on so many other styles yeah. and have them um, in one go. If the atmosphere and the presentation is, is sympathetic enough, then you can retain people's um, interest. But I think there has to be quite a lot of head scratching to get to that point. Sure, sure. Anyway, I'd like to say I'd like to wish you the best of luck with this Thank new you. album. I think it's a, a great record. I've, I've been listening to it a, a few times. I'll repeat it's out on the 10th. I will put the purchasing links below. And uh, best of luck with the tour. And I will especially uh, looking forward to the, the Peterborough show as well. And thank you so much for doing this interview. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Very nice talking to you. Yes. I hope to talk again. Thank you yes, very hopefully. much. Yes, thank you very much. much. Okay, bye. Bye-bye. Anyway, you've been watching an exclusive interview for Classic Album Review. My hope is that there'll be more of these to come. It just leaves me to ask you to be sure to click like, subscribe, and check that bell to get notified of any future uploads. And do check some of the links below this video for ways you can support the work done uh, here at Classic Album Review. It's always much appreciated. Anyway, it just leaves me to say I hope you're all staying well and safe, but more importantly that you keep listening. <laughs>